Hello. Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Michael Seip with Crosspoint Capital. Michael is an investment banker. He uh, is also basically a business broker and helps people in buying and selling businesses. And he helps them also in business improvement. So I asked Michael to join me today and uh, talk to us about preparing to sell a business. So welcome, Michael. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for being here today. So with that, I'm going ahead and get into my first question. Uh, what are some ways buyers and sellers use to determine a value or a sales price for a business? Well, thanks, Mike. You know, there's really a lot of different strategies, many, many, many ways that, um, in fact, you could write a whole library of books on business valuation, but it actually boils down to two simple things, either asset value, in other words, how much stuff have you got, or income, in other words, how much revenue, how much profit does the stuff you have produce. So almost all of the valuation methodologies are going to um, be involved either with an asset approach or an income approach that uh, I find, in, in particularly for profitable businesses, that the income approach, some multiple of earnings, some projected value based on what people expect the business is going to earn, turns out to be the valuation on the company. Yeah. I guess I'll sort of add in related to this, because I get involved in valuation issues myself from time to time, but a lot of times I am just shocked at the values that come up when an actual deal is put together. And the, the reason is, to some degree, and as I've explained to clients on occasion, what is the value to this buyer? And um, so if the business is a particular fit for some reason uh, for a buyer, then they're willing in many cases to pay a premium uh, I had a situation actually uh, with a brother-in-law. He sold his business. It had been running losses for years. It was uh, related to cable television. And somebody came along, another cable company, and offered him a million dollars for the business. <laughs> I was floored. I would have told you it wasn't worth anything. So, you know, uh, so you have to be aware and, and sensitive to that as part of your negotiation, I guess. Well, it's a great point because, you know, there are an awful lot of hidden assets um, that aren't obvious, as well, of course, uh, as uh, hidden liabilities, but there are some hidden assets in many businesses that might not be obvious to the outside viewer. Right. So... Uh, with that, that actually leads into the next question. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> so what are important assets and liabilities that typically aren't on a company's financial statements? Well, one of the, the assets that isn't normally posted on um, a financial statement is the goodwill, the customer base that a business has developed over time, which, of course, really is the most valuable asset of the business. And so who your customers are, how much they buy, how frequently they buy, how persistent they are in doing business with you, and also how influential they are in regard to other customers. Because, you know, all customers aren't necessarily created equal. Some are great references and, uh, and great centers of influence to lead to other customers. And so often there's synergies, which is sometimes why there are strategic buyers. And one of the hidden assets, if you will, that they could be interested in that could cause them to pay what might be considered a premium is um, that one of the customers that you have might be perfect as part of their uh, stable of customers as well. So the customer base is a great uh, asset that's usually not reflected on the financial statements. Another asset that's typically not uh, reflected on the financial statements are the proprietary practices that make a business work. So if someone's been doing a really good job in their business for years, chances are they've developed some trade secrets. Now, they might not be patented or trademarked, but most business owners that have developed a successful business have figured out some special ways that make their business work. And those assets are, you know, there's not really a way to to label them on a financial statement, but those proprietary practices can be very, very valuable to a new owner. And in fact, that's one of the reasons 
that people would buy a business versus starting a business from scratch because there are systems in place that have already been developed so you don't have to start from scratch and, uh, and build all that yourself. So before we go, I want to go on and talk a little about the liabilities uh, in a moment, but I just want to add a comment, and that is that too many small business owners don't pay enough attention to their customer list. And so, I mean, if you go in as a consultant, I think one of the first things that you would ask is, where is your customer list? And what sort of business are you doing with these people? And of course, there is contact management software like ACT and so forth, but critical piece of information, even to make this business successful in the first place, is who the heck are your customers so that you can communicate with them and expand your business with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the liabilities that aren't on the books. Well, one of the liabilities that uh, I find with small companies typically isn't represented on the financial statements are customer deposits. So oftentimes in a business, um, when you make a sale, the customer will put money down or put a deposit down for that order. It happens a lot in uh, the construction industry or in a business where there are custom aspects to what you're doing where you're looking for um, the customer to be invested in the order since you're doing it specifically for them. Well, oftentimes small businesses, and you've probably seen this many, many times, don't actually keep track of that. And so although it, uh, it is very, very much a part of the working capital of the business, it's actually a liability that the, I mean, the cash, of course, mm -hmm. is an asset, but the liability to do the work for the customer is not often reflected. And that can be, uh, when, you, when you stop the business and hand it over to someone new, that can be a real shock to someone that realizes, well, I have a million dollars worth of work that I need to do in order to keep my customers happy. Yeah, so they need to know about prepayments then and, and what are their obligations uh, related to sales that have already been made. That's right. Yeah. Um, so how about another liability that you can think of? And if, it, if you've run out, I may throw in a couple myself. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine you've seen them. Um, one of the things I think that is, uh, is worth taking a look at, particularly as a buyer looks at a, at a business, are the verbal promises that the, the current owner or the previous owner has made to employees, customers, and vendors because frequently in the mix of small business activity there are a lot of things that that just go on where there aren't written contracts to support those but they're promises that the business owner made whether it's to a key vendor a key employee a key customer and even though it's not written down in order to preserve the continuity of the business if the new owner of the company doesn't fulfill that obligation or that promise, then they could lose a key employee, they could lose a key vendor or a key customer. And so understanding what the commitments are that have been made, even if you will, um, on a handshake basis or off the books, pretty important to a new owner. Right.